part of the topic of the the pod, the podcast just mentioned the uh, baseball outside of the Negro Leagues before integration because you know as I've learned about the Negro Leagues recently I've learned about how much baseball was happening outside of the Negro Leagues with a lot of the players involved so I want to introduce some of those players to you uh, through some stats that I've been compiling from a lot of different um, uh, sources so first uh, we'll just we just got this introduction from from Tom, so we can kind of skip through this. This is uh, what I look like when I, I get a headshot, and this is what I look like on a Zoom call. So we've got all that. And uh, you know, June 2021, I'll skip to that. That's when we launched the Negro Leagues or Major Leagues on Baseball Reference. And I'd been familiar with the Negro Leagues before that. I, had, I would not call myself a Negro Leagues researcher before that. But ever since that, you know, I learned through the numbers. And ever since that project, I've just been obsessed with learning more about these players from you know Josh Gibson and and Satchel Page the the players everybody knows right down to the the overlooked legends on the Negro League side of things or the uh you know not even the Negro Leagues outside the Negro Leagues before integration so let's talk about some of those players and the person I'm going to choose to frame this conversation is someone that we all know very well it is Josh Gibson and here he is in Santorce Jersey playing in Puerto Rico but uh this is what we see on his baseball reference page and these are amazing numbers, but this is not the complete career of Josh Gibson. Now, if you go to seamheads.com, they have some more uh, leagues and seasons that could be considered major. I would be happy to talk about that with the uh, folks anytime. Three independent seasons here from very high quality teams from the Grays and Crawfords that are not considered major league at this time. But then outside of the Negro Leagues, we have all of these seasons as well. And there's probably even more than this, but these are the ones that I know about. Everything from uh, pre-professional uh, league teams in Puerto Rico to Venezuela, Cuba, uh, Mexico with Veracruz, who I'm wearing today, uh, and Santorce here uh, in Puerto Rico. Josh Gibson played everywhere, not just in the Negro Leagues. And I mentioned that I've been compiling some stats. This is a purposely small screenshot of the, the stats that I've been compiling for Josh and several of his peers as well. Um, and I have a link to the uh, spreadsheet where these all are now, but I'm gonna just zoom in on the totals here. So the first row is what you see at baseball reference. It's 2,168 at-bats. But if you total up the other stats that you can find in other sources, we have over 4,000 at-bats. And that's a much clearer picture of the, the player here that we're talking about, Josh Gibson, but also the players that I'm going to talk about today. And I find that, you know, the bigger sample you get of stats, the more you can get a feel for who a player was. So that's really the, the purpose of what I'm going to talk about here is, you know, after finding thousands of plate appearances for these players, what kind of players were plying their trade outside of the Negro Leagues all over the Western Hemisphere? Uh, and that you know, the point is that Josh Gibson was not alone. There were several other players doing this. And uh, there were so many players I wanted to focus on, but to really focus this talk, I chose 10 players and arranged them as an all-star team. So one at each position, and we have a manager. Uh, what everybody has in common is that they are not in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. They played in several countries. They may or may not have played in the Negro Leagues and their careers overlapped with Josh Gibson. So I'm looking for players who were contemporaries of Josh. And this is that team. So I won't read through all their names because I'm going to go through them one-on-one -on -one and share some facts and stats about them. But we're going to start first with our manager and utility player, Lazaro Salazar. But first, I am merely an aggregator. I do not want to, uh, you to know, think that I've gone through all the box scores and all the newspapers and compiled all these stats. These come from many, many different sources, one of them being baseball reference, but one of them is seam heads. Of course, um, much of the much or all of the Negro League data on uh, baseball reference comes from seam heads, but also a lot more research on the other leagues from the Center for Negro League Baseball Research, research from Dr. Leighton Revell and Luis Munoz, uh, our friend Jorge Colon Delgado, who's uh, in, in the chat today. Uh, his Negro Leaguers in Puerto Rico site was a huge uh, boost for this because he has a lot of great stats there. Polota Benaria has several stats in Venezuela, and there are a couple books here as well with stats on Cuban and Mexican League uh, data. And uh, I'm merely an aggregator. So I just put this all together in a way that looks like a baseball reference page, so to speak, so that we can see the career stats of these players. So let's go ahead and start with Lazaro Salazar. So born in Cuba, and he died at the age of 44, uh, very sudden and, and very way too early. But he left an incredible legacy. And uh, 
all we see on baseball reference for him is a few seasons from when he was very young. It's, it's starting here at age 17. So just 149 games, but we see signs of a 300 hitter. And he also pitched as well, but we see a, a really nice 2.36 ERA that has a sparkling 200 ERA plus. But uh, of course, that is not all that there is to the career of Lazaro Salazar. He was a three-way star. Now I'm calling a three-way star hitter, pitcher, and manager from 1930 to 57. Played a long time and managed a long time in Mexico. That's where he was a legend. His native Cuba, also a very extensive career in Venezuela, the USA, and one season in the Dominican Republic, a very important one. That was the 1937 Trujillo season that you saw the, the team photo on slide one. Uh, so Josh Gibson, Satchel Page, Cool Papa Bell, Sammy Bankhead, Silvio Garcia all played on that team, but Salazar was the player manager. Salazar is a three-time Hall of Famer. So in Cuba, in Mexico, and in Venezuela, he was a two-time MVP. Uh, so much like the, the stats here, I want to remind everyone that the awards here are a minimum. You know, I, I've collected as many batting titles, MVPs, gold gloves, all-stars as I could find, but that just means that's the minimum. There could be more. Uh, I, we know that he was an MVP two times, both in Cuba, three batting titles, two in Cuba, one in Mexico, a couple of gold gloves. Didn't know they were given out that long ago, but I found uh, some a, a note that he won two gold gloves in Mexico. 10-time All-Star, eight of them in Mexico, two in Cuba. And as a manager, 14 league championships, seven in Mexico, three in Cuba, three in Venezuela, and one in the Dominican Republic. So what do his stats like? Look, stats look like? In that spreadsheet, this is way too small again. Don't worry, I'm going to give you the totals. But this shows kind of the, the, the breadth of what I've collected. We've got batting stats, pitching stats, and managing stats there. But if you total them all up, <clears throat> We have 4,774 at-bats and a 314 average, 49 home runs. For each player, I, I put this as a rate for 600 at-bats. So you can see about what a uh, you know, typical ALNL season might look like if you just uh, you know, normalize these stats to, to a 600 at-bat season. And you can see that uh, we, with Lazaro Salazar, we see a very strong contact hitter, a uh, little bit of uh, you know, gap power, not, not home run power, but lots of runs batted in and runs scored. Uh, our friend, uh, Eric Shalek, a researcher who provides major league equivalencies for Negro League players. So very quickly, what he does is he tries to estimate using a lot of math, <laughs> what a single player would look like if he was you know, his, his context was taken out of the, the Negro Leagues and placed into the AL and NL of, of the, the time. So this is not estimating what would happen if the entire major leagues were integrated. That's a much larger project that would be very difficult, but maybe somebody could tackle that. This just intends to take Lazaro Salazar, if he was just put right into the AL, NL scenario, what, what's our best estimate of what he could look like? And Eric has a 2,600 hit pitcher, uh, sorry, 2,600 hit hitter, uh, 115 home runs, 1,100 RBI, and a 300 average. And here you can, again, see the, the rate stats per 600 at-bats, kind of similar to what we saw when we collected nearly 5,000 at-bats in, in the different countries. And uh, Eric uh, believes that, or the, the math believes that Lazaro Salazar, if he was in the major leagues at the time, the ALNL major leagues, would be about a 63 war player, which is a very, very, very good career. Now, of course, Lazaro Salazar was only a part-time hitter. He was also a pitcher. I have fewer pitching stats, but uh, we have almost 800 inning, 1,800 innings pitched with a 127 and 85 record and 348 ERA. The MLEs think that if he pitched his full career as a pitcher, um, the MLEs don't think that he would have been a two-way player, which you could argue with, but uh, we'll go with it and uh, thinks that he would be about 194 and 174 with a 3.44 ERA. Again, in terms of wins above replacement, 53, so a very, very strong career yet again. And here again, I also have his manager totals, 1,153 wins, 562 winning percentage, and 14 titles. So that's Lazaro Salazar. We have a lot of players to get through, so I'm going to run through similar stats for, for many of the other players on this team here. And our pitcher is Ramon Bragaña. And he's another Cuban player who really made his name in Mexico as well, although he pitched in a lot of different places. 
all we have on baseball reference is a few games from when he was 19 years old. And it, they weren't necessarily just pitching performances. He was playing everywhere. In fact, I think the position he played most often was catcher in that one season. But Ramon also had a very, very long career, 28 to 55, 23 seasons in Mexico, many of them before the professional league. But he also played in Cuba, the USA, Dominican Republic, and Venezuela. He managed off and on from 1944 to 56. Wanted to call out one season in particular, his first one as a manager in 1944, uh, again for Veracruz, who I'm wearing today. So Rogers Hornsby was originally the manager of the team, and he quit after the team started six and four. And Bragania took over as the manager, but he was also the ace pitcher and a uh, spot starter in the outfield when he wasn't pitching, because he could also hit. And he went 30 and eight that season and managed Veracruz to the title. And that is the only 30 win season in Mexican league history. And he also hit 277 that year. And that was just a couple of years after he nearly led the league in home runs, just missing out to uh, Monte Irvin. So this is a guy who could swing the bat pretty well as well. He is also a three-time hall of famer in Cuba in Mexico and in the Latino baseball hall of fame. I found five all-star appearances in Mexico, an MVP in the Dominican Republic, and also a couple of gold gloves, both in Mexico. For the stats that I've collected, I have found 294 wins so far, which I really wanna find those last six, but there's, there's so many stats missing from early in his career that he's, we know that he's very clearly way over the 300 line. And it's more likely that if you collect all the stats that could possibly be available, we're looking more at like a 400 win pitcher and, you know, across all of the leagues he played in. So 294 and 223, 3.55 ERA. I think it's really interesting. He's not a truly dominant pitcher, but one of those workhorses who wins far more often than he loses and just keeps his team in every game. Plus he played in some high uh, octane environments as well. The MLEs love him as well. 279 and 238, 3.67 ERA. And one thing that you'll notice here is that the numbers again match up pretty well with what I've found across the other leagues, which is interesting because I I, I started tallying these stats after uh, the, the MLEs were available from, from Eric Shalek. So I found that to be quite interesting. So Bragania as a hitter, 249 batting average, but more pop. I think he actually had more home runs than Salazar in about half the at bat. So you can see that he's a uh, an interesting hitting pitcher with with some power off the bat. And there's some manager totals just from a few of the seasons that I was able to collect. So on our team, who is Bragania pitching to? And that is the great Quincy Troop. Uh, Troop, of course, had a, an amazing career that spanned many, many different countries and even brought him to the American League briefly for, for one season. On his baseball reference page, we see uh, Negro League season starting at 17. We see far more seasons than, than we have from a lot of other players. And you can see here in 1952, he made his appearance with Cleveland as well. Just a, a long and distinguished career. And uh, here are more stats than you see just on, in the, these 158 games. But first he played 100, he played from 1930 to 54. He missed 1937 with injury. He played in seven different countries here, right down to Colombia, which we don't see very much. Um, he had a, a season there and, and another as a manager, uh, but he played in Mexico, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Canada. In the USA, he actually also played with the independent Bismarck's uh, in, in North Dakota. And we have some stats uh, from, from that as well. Not much though. He also played one season in the California Winter League. So just a, even in the United States, a variety of different uh, places that he played outside of the, the Negro Leagues. He also managed several seasons. He won a World Series, of course, with the Cleveland Buckeyes. And uh, a, he was a manager of the year in Puerto Rico as well. I found uh, these, these came from his book mostly, which is wonderful. 20-time uh, All-Star, five of them in the major Negro Leagues, eight in Mexico, two in Puerto Rico, two in Venezuela, one in Cuba, one in Canada, and one in Colombia. And that's just amazing to see All-Star appearances spread out all over the hemisphere. Just amazing. For him, 4,428 at-bats, 290 catcher with power. Uh, love to see it. Uh, across 600 at-bats, you're looking at a 290 with a lot of doubles, triples, and, and a solid amount of home runs there. Um, good run producer as well. 
the MLEs uh, think that he would hit 264 in the majors, which is, you have to remember, a major league catcher, uh, you know, it's much harder to, to put up uh, high offensive numbers in the, in the AL and NL. The, the MLEs think that he would have a wins above replacement total of 44 which is lower than some of the other players, but catchers are always lower anyway. Some of the, some of the major league uh, AL and NL catchers that are around 44 war include Buster Posey, Bill Freehan, Thurman Munson, and Jorge Posada. So these are very, very strong catchers. And Quincy Troop, of course, was a very strong catcher. Over at first base, we have the most mysterious of the players because he never, he's the one that never played in the major Negro leagues here. And if the name looks familiar, that's because he is the father of Hall of Famer Orlando Cepeda, and that is uh, Pedro Perucho Cepeda. He was born in Puerto Rico. And again, he had a couple offers to come to the Negro Leagues, but never actually did it. Now, if you look at his baseball reference page, well, he doesn't even come up in the search. So um, I'm going to look to tr try to solve that at some point because we do have some stats, many of them thanks to our friend Jorge uh, at, uh, coming from Puerto Rico. But he also played seven seasons in Venezuela and four in the Dominican Republic. He was also uh, Josh Gibson's teammate on that uh, Trujillo team as well in the Dominican that year. Uh, a Hall of Famer two times over, once in Puerto Rico, and then in 2015, he was inducted into the Latino Baseball Hall of Fame. A pair of batting titles, both in Puerto Rico. I believe it was the first two of the league as well. And we're missing a lot of stats for Perucho. That's because he was about 32 when the league actually started. So we have no stats at all before 32. So this is already an aging Perucho Cepeda. Uh, so now that we look at these stats, we can see you can only wonder what he would have looked like, not just if we had stats before age 32, but what he would have looked like if he had gotten a chance in the American League or National League. Uh, but of course, like all of the players we're talking about today, he was not able to get that chance. But in what we have, 1,642 at-bats, a 325 average with power. Uh, again, this is a shortstop here uh, with with some gap power there with all the triples and, and some, some home run pop there, six home runs and 110 runs batted in. But that 325 batting average really stands out when you consider this is from age 32 on. Now, unfortunately, because of his lack of statistics, we don't have an MLE, which makes him, again, one of the great mysteries on this team. Our second baseman was born in the US, Marvin Williams. He's the, the youngest guy on this team and he played all over the United States, but also all over outside of the United States. On his baseball reference page, we have very little, but look at these numbers. <laughs> Across three seasons, uh, age 23 to 25, a 382 average, 427 OBP, 584 slugging. This is like a clue into like, wait, what, what kind of player was Marvin Williams? So that's when I, you know, he's one of the players that made me embark on this kind of journey here to, to find more stats to say, you know, what does he look like in a sample size that's, well, the sample size I have is about 20 times more than this. So let's see a little bit of more, more about Marvin first. Played from 1940 to 61. Again, a lot of it in the United States, uh, 11 seasons in organized baseball, but he also played three in Indian semi-pro. In Mexico, he played six summer seasons and eight winter seasons, played a couple seasons in Puerto Rico and three in Venezuela. 13-time All-Star, three-time batting title. He won an MVP award and a triple crown one year in the Arizona Texas League. And let's go ahead and look at some of these stats for Marvin Williams. So again, about 20X the plate appearances now, 6,732. This is a big sample. 2,166 hits, 332 home runs, over 1,400 runs batted in, 322 average, 534 slugging. So he's really maintaining some really strong numbers as this sample size grows. And it shows that Marvin Williams, you know, are we looking at like a Jeff Kent type hitter here uh, at second base? Now the MLEs, they think he was around 280, 269 home runs, but again, almost 2,500 hits. Um, the wins above replacement, Seems a little bit low to me, 45. I think it's because it didn't see him as a very strong defender at second base, which maybe <laughs> makes the Jeff Kent comparison hold up pretty well. But uh, yeah, what a player we have here. Over 300 home runs, 322 average. Uh, Marvin Williams, uh, I love him. And a very similar player to Marvin Williams in, in terms of the stats, uh, Buster Clarkson. He also played very briefly in the National League, uh, not long enough and way too late. 
uh, he, he's listed as a, uh, actually like Perucho here, uh, he was also a shortstop, but I had way too many shortstops. So I spread them around the infield. Buster did play a lot of third base later in his career. And Perucho played a lot of first base later in his career. Plus I thought putting Cepeda at first base was a nice nod to Orlando as well. But let's talk about Buster here. On his baseball reference page, we see uh, a few seasons here split around uh, many different teams. Um, I took this screenshot before we added that the gap between 1942 and 46 was because he spent three years serving in World War II as well. We, we show that on his player page now. But uh, again, in the six seasons that we have here, five of them in the Negro Leagues and one of them in the NL, you see 318 average, just about a 400 on base percentage, 928 OPS, just a, a marvelous hitter. So let's see how it holds up as we expand to more of a sample. Uh, but like I said, missed three years for World War II, 13 seasons in the U.S., seven of them in the quote-unquote organized majors and minors. Puerto Rico, he played 11 seasons. He is a Hall of Famer there. He is a legend there. In Mexico, he also played in four seasons, and he had a season in Canada as well. So in Puerto Rico, 1953, he was a player manager, and he won the Caribbean Series. I mentioned he's a Hall of Famer there. He's one of four players in the history of the league to have a 300 average and 500 slugging percentage. He had 98 home runs there, just a, an incredible career um, that he's uh, rightfully a, a Hall of Famer there. And his, his uh, exploits in the Caribbean series also got him into the Caribbean Baseball Hall of Fame in 2020. A two-time All-Star. I don't have All-Star data from Puerto Rico. I'm sure that uh, he was an All-Star there if, if that was uh, uh, something that they awarded. Um, one was in the major Negro leagues and the other, I believe was 1949, uh, another league that is not considered major at this time, but of course is continuously up for debate. So let's go to the stats, uh, similar sample to, uh, Marvin Williams and quite frankly, similar numbers over 2000 hits, 326 home runs, 1352 runs batted in, uh, over 600 at bats. We're looking at a 30 home run hitter, 30 doubles, 123 runs batted in, just a massive run producer everywhere he went. 315 average, 532 slugging, and the MLEs love him as well. Uh, 286, 23 home runs, and 86 runs batted in for a typical season, and the wins above replacement at 58. And some of that too is because he's be considered a shortstop with the MLEs as well. I just moved him to third because I needed to, to fit some uh, several amazing shortstops on this team. Speaking of amazing shortstops, we're going to go to the one that actually ended up being named the shortstop on this team, and that is another player from Cuba, Silvio Garcia. You may know the story about how he was uh, reportedly the, the first player that the Dodgers were targeting to break the color barrier. But when asked uh, how he would react to a white player spitting in his face, he said that he would then kill that player, which, of course, was not going to be what uh, the Dodgers organization was going for. And, you know, a lot of other uh, bricks fell into place and Jackie Robinson ended up breaking the color barrier instead. But Silvio Garcia was that type of player that could have been an option to break that color line. So what do we see on baseball reference? Just four seasons, all with the New York Cubans, but we see some great work here. 322 average, uh, multiple all-stars uh, as a shortstop here. And he played everywhere as well. I've said that a lot, but uh, I feel like we have countries popping up here that we haven't seen in other places. He played two seasons in Nicaragua, uh, in addition to 20 in Cuba, just five in the United States, so very few here but several in Venezuela, Dominican Republic, three in Canada, and even one season in Puerto Rico. He's a kind of a Hall of Famer two times over. The Cuba Hall of, Cuban Hall of Fame, um, it, this would be almost another topic, but there's a, an era where they're not officially Hall of Famers because it wasn't officially given out by the Cuban Baseball Hall of Fame. It was given out by a different group, but he was part of that other group that was awarded in 1975, and he was also inducted into the Latino Baseball Hall of Fame in 2013. Two MVP awards in Cuba, nine-time All-Star, again, at least nine times. And I say nine-time, I, I mean nine seasons. You remember on the the baseball reference page he played in four all-star games in the Negro Leagues, but it was across two seasons. So I'm counting that as two seasons. Three batting titles here, including one in Canada. Uh, one He won the Triple Crown in Canada one of the years that he played there. 
and he even had an ERA title early on. He he pitched a little bit and uh, that coincided with his one year in Puerto Rico where he went one year and he won the ERA title. So just really kind of an, an amazing fact uh, and a long and distinguished career that uh, he also has an ERA title in there. I have the largest sample for Silvio. We're talking like 8,500 at-bats here, 2,636 hits, 420 doubles, 133 home runs. Again, this is for a short stop before um, the integration of the game. This is a, a while ago. Home runs were not expected from your shortstop. Nearly 1,300 runs batted in and also 324 stolen bases, which again, that's definitely a minimum because I don't have stolen bases for all of these seasons I'm tabulating. 311, 429 against, again, it's across a huge sample of at-bats. And if you average those out um, and then look at the MLEs and they, they, they hold up pretty similarly, again, like 294 batting average, uh, looking at like 26 doubles, six triples, 11 home runs a year uh, from your um, shortstop. And Silvio was a great player for a long time. You can see here the MLEs think that it would be over 10,000 at-bats. And this is at-bats, not plate appearances, because one of the, the stat ca categories that's very inconsistent is walks. All right. I uh, feel like I'm flying through this, but now we're onto our, our outfield here, and I'm hoping that there's some great questions as well. So start thinking of those questions as well. We're going back to Puerto Rico for our left fielder, uh, Pancho Coimbre. Uh, I look at Pancho, I, I think Tony Gwynn. I look at Pancho's stats and I really think Tony Gwynn. Uh, but first, a little bit about Pancho here. Uh, on, on baseball reference, we see 334, which again, feels very Tony Gwynn-like across 139 games. Uh, and can he stretch it over across a larger sample? Let's see. Played 21 seasons in Puerto Rico. I only have stats for the professional seasons, unfortunately. And again, he was nearly 30 when the league went professional. So we're missing a lot of data for Pancho as well. And the data that we do have tends to be when he's a little older. So I think he's even more impressive than, than what we're going to see here. Eight seasons in the Dominican Republic, four in the US, four in Venezuela, two in Mexico, one in Canada, one in Colombia. Pancho was everywhere. He's a Hall of Famer in Puerto Rico as part of the inaugural class and also in the 2010 class for the Latino Baseball Hall of Fame. Oh, I do have three all-star games here in Puerto Rico, so I, I need to find more of those as well. Maybe Jorge can help me with those. But again, we saw two more seasons as an all-star in the Negro Leagues. He also had two batting titles in Puerto Rico. Uh, remember, he had to compete with Perugia Cepeda to get those as well. And an MVP award in Puerto Rico. And let's see the stats. 3,493 at-bats, a 336 batting average, 468 slugging percentage. Uh, we're looking at uh, for every 600 at-bats, over 200 hits, over 40 doubles, over 100 runs batted in 336. Just a, a brilliant hitter. The MLEs uh, think that he would hit 309 and has some questions about his plate discipline. That's why you see a lower uh, 38 war total here. I think that's a little low to be completely honest for uh, for Pancho here. I think Pancho was, uh, you know, his his uh, OBP in the Negro Leagues was, I think it was 393. So I think it would hold up pretty well. So I, I'll take this one with a, a little bit of a grain of salt. I think he was better than this, but still this MLE sees him with 2,937 hits, almost 500 doubles over hundred home runs. So, you know, this is like an MLE that I feel like is a little bit conservative, but still has some astronomical totals for Pancho. Our center fielder, uh, the last uh, Negro Leaguers in Puerto Rico webinar I did with Jorge was about all about Tatela Vargas, uh, just a unbelievable player who I think is absolutely an all-time great. And uh, I am very pleased to talk about him a little bit more here. What we see on his baseball reference page is a few seasons, but you see in that last one, that is currently the all-time single season batting average record on baseball reference. Now that we've added Negro League records, it's not, you know, it's not Ty Cobb with single season batting averages. It's not any of the 19th century hitters. It's not Josh Gibson even. It's Tatelo Vargas in 1943. And, you know, there's only 30 games there, but we do the best with the data that we have. And if more uh, box scores are found from other seasons, this batting record could change. But right now, it belongs to, to Taylor Vargas. And among all the players in the history of the game, that's an amazing uh, achievement to have. 
So you can see that the stats here, some of them are age 21, some of them are age 37. This was a long career. He played 1923 to 1956. He played 33 seasons in six countries and 22 of them were in Puerto Rico. Now he's, uh, he was born in the Dominican Republic known as the Domin Dominican deer, but he ended up moving to living in and uh, marrying in and dying in Puerto Rico. He, he really embraced the country and uh, was a star there. He was a hall of famer there. He was also a hall of famer in that odd period of Cuban baseball history um, where it's not officially a hall of famer. Um, I think that it's likely that he would probably uh, be chosen again uh, on a quote unquote official level. And he's in the Latino Baseball Hall of Fame class of 2010. Eight time All Star, three in Venezuela, three in Puerto Rico, two in the Negro Leagues, three batting titles, uh, one in the US, one in Puerto Rico, one in the Dominican Republic. The gold glove here, I just happened to find a gold glove for him because it was noted, um, this is from Dr. Leighton Ravel, that he won the gold glove in the Dominican Republic at age 47. Uh, so he was still going strong at that point. Uh, I believe that he also had a batting title that year as well. 5,219 at-bats. And again, the vast majority of these are from, you know, the, the early to mid thirties on. Totelo played a long, long career. So the fact that we only have 5,000 at-bats is really more about the fact that, you know, we're missing that first half of his career, which could be seen as his prime. He, he started as a shortstop um, and was just lightning fast. You can see here, 214 stolen bases. And that's, Again, one of the stats that I, I have the, the least consistent um, coverage on and runs batted in as well are quite low for him because I'm missing a lot of RBI for him. Plus, I think he was a leadoff hitter most often. But you see the 129 runs scored per 600 at bats and the 194 hits. He could hit, he could fly, just an amazing player. The MLEs absolutely love him. They think he'll be a, he would be a 3,000 hit man be with that long career and the hitting ability that he had that uh, the MLEs think that uh, you know, 3,000 hits and nearly 70 war is the type of player we're looking at. Uh, you can also see 530 doubles, 135 triples and over 100 home runs. So still plenty of pop there. The stolen bases feel surprisingly low uh, considering the, the, uh, you know, the record that I have found and then just how he was talked about. But, uh, you know, the, it's the data that is generating these. So it could be that some of the data inputs are missing there, but maybe they can be uh, filled in with, with some of what I found. So I'll see if I can help there. Again, nearly a 70 war player, possibly, if, if he was uh, given the opportunity um, that none of these players were given. And that's it, it. It's frustrating to say that over and over again, but it's also nice to have the opportunity to, to talk about some of these players in this type of scenario. So thank you for that. And we're jumping to our last player now. And at first I had Wild Bill right here. And Wild Bill is, it was an amazing player uh, in the US and Mexico. Um, but, you know, the more I, I've done research, I felt like Bob Thurman was a part of, he felt like he belonged with this team a little bit more just because you know, he played a lot in the U.S. He played in the in the Negro Leagues. He played in the uh, major leagues with the with uh, he played in the National League with the Cincinnati Reds. But in between there, he toiled in the minors for quite a bit. But he also was just an absolute star in Puerto Rico. He is the all time home run hitter in Puerto Rico. And so many wonderful players played in that league. What do we have on baseball reference? You can see the gap here between 48 and 55, which we'll plug in but played for the Homestead Grays. You can see that he did not start until age 29. And that's because he also served in World War II for several years. And before that, he was only playing semi-pro ball. So when I said that uh, everybody here overlapped with Josh Gibson, you can see that they were teammates for that 1946 season. Um, but that was when Thurman was already 29 years old. So again, this is a player that we're missing a lot of information from. Everything here is from age 29 on, because before that it was semi-pro and military. And he was discovered playing in the military. And uh, at, at that point, he, he could also pitch a little bit too. He didn't have great success pitching in the Negro Leagues, as you can see here in this small 24 game sample, but he was uh, better, more well known as a pitcher in Puerto Rico as well. And let's take a look at some of these stats that we have. 
46 to 61, again, missed three years for World War II, uh, 14 seasons in the U.S., 12 in Puerto Rico, uh, two in the Dominican Republic. He is a he was in the inaugural class uh, for the Puerto Rican Baseball Hall of Fame and then uh, in the 2020 class for the Caribbean Baseball Hall of Fame because he had a couple of great uh, Caribbean series uh, wins and an MVP award in Puerto Rico. And again, like I said, these stats are, it's all from age 29 on. 6,827 at-bats, over 2,000 hits, over 250 home runs, 296 average, which is a little bit lower than some of the other players we have, but 487 slugging is very high uh, for this group of players that we're taking. On a rate basis, 600 at-bats, uh, we're talking 22 home runs, over 100 RBI, over 100 runs, or exactly 100 runs. And then you can see as a pitcher, we got 44 wins and 41 losses. That includes the, the down seasons that he had in the Negro Leagues, um, but uh, the, the stats in Puerto Rico bring it up. And he has no MLE available uh, because so much of his stats actually do come from uh, the minor leagues in, in the United States and five seasons with the Cincinnati Reds. So we don't need an equivalency there, uh, obviously. But uh, also we don't have complete seasons, for, uh, stats from top to bottom for Puerto Rico. If we get that at some point, which Jorge and I are working on, uh, we could possibly get some even better MLEs for some of these players. So again, that is the outsider baseball all-star team that I've presented here. I have just all the stats all at once uh, on a per 600 at bat basis here. If we wanna just kind of take a look at the team all, all at once, I've highlighted the, the players that uh, led the group. Like you can see here that Vargas had the most runs scored, uh, Pancho Coimbra, the most hits and doubles and highest batting average, Cepeda with the triples, Clarkson with the home runs, though Williams is right behind him, and those two are right together with the runs batted in as well. Vargas with the stolen bases, and Williams with the slugging, again, with Clarkson right after him. And that is my uh, presentation. Um, thank you for allowing me to, to share some, some stats and facts about several players uh, all at once here. And uh, yeah, happy to start taking some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, lots of uh, fantastic stories about these players in addition to the stats that you've shared. I mean, you really brought them to life for us. Uh, I think that's a, a, a huge help. Uh, Ted, you and I were seeing that maybe the chat's not working for Q&A. Some folks have dumped questions in, I'm uh, sorry, for the chat. Uh, some have dumped them into the Q&A. Do you want to do the Q&A and I'll, and I'll uh, follow up with uh, whatever additional help we need? Actually, uh, no, I'm not doing a good job with the Q&A myself, but I do have some questions in between yours. Well, super, let me let me uh, raise a couple, uh, Adam, that have surfaced, uh, and then we also can turn on the audio for folks to, to chime in, maybe with some additional insight, but we don't want to confine people just simply to the printed word here. Uh, Gary Gillette asks, he says, the home run rates for many of these hitters seem pretty low. Is that a function of the overall home run rates for the leagues they played in? That's a great question. Uh, the We really just have a couple of home run hitters. And I, I don't know if I have a great answer to that yet. I, I have not found evidence of, of where the power was coming from in, in some of these leagues. Like uh, I know that some early leagues in Cuba, uh, the, the power was non-existent. Uh, but th those seasons are typically before these players that we're looking at. I think in, in general, I, I tended to pick some players that were not power hitters, like uh, Vargas, Garcia, and Coimbra here were not typically power hitters. Um, but still, I think when you're looking at 30 home runs per 600 at-bats across a long career, that actually is quite a bit of power. I don't know if we have any MLE 500 home run hitters here, but we do have uh, you know, three players with some power. And you know, Troop's 14 home runs per 600 at-bats for a catcher is pretty solid as well. But yeah, I think in general, they're not all sluggers, um, but there are a couple here. Uh, Alan Saul asks, he says, is, is Bob related to the theologian Howard Thurman? Do you know offhand? I actually do not know. And if, if one person in the world did know this, it would be Jorge. So he could feel free to, to chime in as well. 
I think we should uh, bring Jorge online at some point to, to, to weigh in given all, all of his work. So Jorge, we'll put you on the spot in a minute or two. Uh, I know the one that appealed to me a great interest was Clarkson. He was born next door to, to my hometown. So I need to look into him more. I didn't realize there was somebody, I think you had to connect Pennsylvania. So that mm -hmm. really intrigued me. Ted, over to you. Okay, yes. Uh, one, one of the best things, Adam, first of all, great presentation. But uh, Thank you. you're highlighting some players that in my opinion, clearly have Hall of Fame status. And, and let's key in on Cepeda. Uh, this is the best thing about your presentation. And in my opinion, it's the worst because there are so many Negro leaguers. Dick Lundy is the first that comes to mind that need to be put into the hall. Yet you're making legitimate arguments. So uh, I applaud you, but your your message is really directed at the Hall of Fame. They need to open the door. So that's one question. Another one I have. Well, do you have any comment on that? Uh, yeah, I I absolutely believe that the the Hall of Fame has plenty of room for more players from the Negro Leagues. It's a great question about these players though, because then you have to get into, well, it's the national baseball hall of fame, you know, Sadaharu O is not in the baseball hall of fame. Should these players be eligible because they didn't really play in the United States. So how, how much do we take the word uh, national to, to how, how much do we hold to that? You know, you can yes. make a case that, you know, Jose Mendez and Cristobal Torriente may be you know, they played a lot outside of the U.S., just like these players as well. So it's really that gray area. But, you yeah. know, not even bringing up the players we've talked about today, you're right that there's, you know, tens, if not dozens of players from the Negro Leagues in the United States that deserve a long look. Lundy, like you mentioned, I could throw out a lot of names as well as of many players that I'm very interested in as well. Okay, and then a quickie. Pancho Cambre in the seam head stats really doesn't strike out at all. Do you have a feel for his strikeout rate? He he went, you know, I'll go ahead and show uh, Negro Leaguers from Puerto Rico here. This is Jorge's site. So I'm going to uh, pull up Cambre's stats here because he, you're right, he just did not strike out. Uh, and we don't have strikeout data for every single season, but the strikeout column here. So these seasons, we don't have it for these, as far as I know, are complete stats. And he was striking out two times, one time, one time per year. In fact, you know what? These three seasons, we do have strikeout data. It just happens to be zero. <laughs> let, 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 let me see. Yep. Here we go. Uh, he did not strike out those wow. three years. Wow. So that's that's true. The it's the first season that we don't have strikeout data for. And uh yeah, that's that's noted um here as well. Three seasons that he did. So Thank yeah, you. it's it's absolutely true. He just did not strike out. Again, the Tony Gwynn comparison <laughs> keeps holding true for me for uh Pancho. Ted, I'm going to um, back in. Uh, William Clark uh, takes us back again to the home run conversation. And there's a little bit of a thread here. Gary chime in. Let me share that. And then uh, we'll turn the mic on. What hey, we'd love to hear your thoughts on any and all of this. But uh, William Clark's comment is I think it resonates for all of us. This is quite a team that you've assembled here. Uh, they certainly do need more recognition. And on the home run total rate, he was wondering aloud were the ballparks really conducive to power hitters per se. Uh, Gary jumped in to say other possibilities would be the baseball or the ballpark dimensions or the altitude. And, and then, uh, Jorge, we're putting you on the spot big time here, but maybe a lot of these Latin ballparks were at sea level and might have been fishing parks. So I'm going to do my best here to do the technology thing. Uh, and uh, Jorge, uh, please feel free to jump in. We benefit a lot from what you've done here to help in this conversation. Hi, everyone. You hear me? Yes. Yes, we do. 
Hi, 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 Ted, uh, Adam, and Thomas. Uh, uh, regarding the home runs, uh, the measures of the ballparks in Puerto Rico in that time from 1938 to 1949 were, you know, uh, big parks, 425, 385 by lines, uh, 425 by center field. Almost every park was, were, were very big. So that's why you see a low rate for Perucho Cepeda in his case. But in uh, and, and esto, there's a, a guy Bene, from Venezuela said once that the, the largest home run that he saw in his life was one that Perucho Cepeda connected in Venezuela. Uh, so he was a very pow powerful uh, slower, very uh, powerful shortstop. And he's the only one, in case of the Perucho, he's the only native, the only Puerto Rican who has uh, batted 400 plus in two positions. He did it as a shortstop and he did it as a first baseman. And in, nine, in the 30s, before the professional baseball league in Puerto Rico, he was the best imported player in Venezuela. So he was quite a, a, a great player, but he, he had a bad temperament, temperament. And he received invitation from Dick, uh, from Dick Harris and from Clarence Pond to go to the States and from Alex Pompez, three invitations to go to the United States, but he didn't, he didn't go to the States because he knew that he would not tolerate uh, racism in the United States. And that's the case of, of Perucho Cepeda. Regarding Pancho Coimbre, I think that those four seasons, Pancho batted everywhere, but I, I think they're asking for maybe a, uh, at least 10 seasons in the Negro Leagues to be uh, oh, to go yes. to the Hall of Fame. So he's under, he was considered he and Tetelo were considered in 19 mm -hmm. in 2006 in the first ballot, and then in the second round they they didn't get they didn't do the second ballot. But he was in the original ballot of the 2006 both Coimbre and uh, and Tetelo Vargas. Uh, regarding the question of is Bob related to Alonjin Howard Thurman, that's the first time I've heard the, the that name Howard Thurman. So I don't think so that they were related. Great. Thank you, Jorge. I just, if you're wondering what I put up on the screen here, these are the all-time home run leaders in the Puerto Rican League. Um, but Kevin Johnson also notes that the, the Cuban leagues generally had low home run totals. Mexico, however, um, had a lot of home runs. And I, I think that we saw that with Ramon Bragaña, you know, a pitcher had, had higher home run totals than other players. Um, and uh, Marvin Williams had a lot of home runs in Mexico as well. Although it, I think it just speaks to the full, fact that you know Lazaro Salazar probably just was not a home run hitter uh because he wasn't hitting them in Mexico either but he was a contact hitter and a pitcher so he he, did, he had his other skills yes Thank and you. I think in the case of Coimbra I don't I don't I, I think that he he was like Tony Wing as, as you said in your presentation mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh Perucho was more slower than Pancho Coimbra uh he was a big man almost six feet very very strong man and uh, I don't think Pancho was so strong. He was more of a hitter. But I, I want to congratulate you. Excellent presentation, Adam. A lot of information. So keep up with the good work. Thank you so much, Jorge. So much of this was thanks to you. <laughs> okay, my friend. Well, and I think, I think uh, again, to Ted's earlier point, uh, Adam's insights on a number of players you don't normally keep in mind you know, or have front of mind reminds us how significant the work is. I think Gary's saying this in the Q&A uh, very much so. How much work is to be done to bring in the appropriate additional players into the hall to make it truly a recognition of the all-time greats? Uh, William Clark comment about Quincy Troop, well stated. Actually, Adam, thank you for mentioning Quincy's book. I hadn't realized he had done one and I went online uh, while you were talking and ordered uh, copies. So that'll be fun to, to gain his insights. Uh, William Clark has another comment. Rucho de Bolsapeta obviously earned his nickname. How good might he have been in the U.S.? Adam, you got to that a little bit, but you want to expand on that some. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll notice that uh, along with Bob Thurman, uh, Cepeda was the one that did not have a major league equivalency. So there, there wasn't enough data for uh, my friend Eric Shea like to even make an estimation. But, you know, when you line up the stats here, you can see a, an, kind of an idea uh, of how he would look. Yes, he had a, a much smaller sample. And again, Cepeda was, everything was age 32 and later. Um, so we're not even looking at prime Cepeda here. And, and we've got a 325 hitter, uh, 11 triples per 600. You know, I, I guess that maybe talks more about how Jorge mentioned Cepeda was a power hitter, but the parks were also huge where you see Cepeda is leading this group in triples. And again, in his 30s. Um, so how good could he have been? That's one of the great what ifs of of like baseball in, in general, I think, is is Perucha Cepeda. You know, at least with a lot of these players, we saw a glimpse in the Negro Leagues to get an idea. You know, it wasn't even the AL and NL, but it was the 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 top league that they were able to to play in at that time. So we can kind of see the players that have translated from the Negro Leagues to the AL and NL and get an idea of how those players would have translated. But with Cepeda, we don't even have that, you know, small bit of time in the Negro Leagues. What we can do, though, is look at his stats in Puerto Rico and see what other similar players did, like, uh, you know, to Taylor Vargas. We see that, you know, he was in Puerto Rico in his 30s and performing very well. What did he do in the Negro Leagues? Well, he set the all-time batting average record. So, you know, <laughs> there's, there's so many what-ifs here. I have one more, Tom. Yeah, I, go ahead. I have one, and then we'll turn it back over to Sean as we close out. You okay. Uh, Adam, it, it seems to me that the baseball reference offensive statistics, which are for the seven approved major league Negro Leagues, mm -hmm. are a little bit higher than the other half of the statistics in seam heads from those independent and other not yet seen as major leagues. I don't know if you agree with that, but that's that's what my eye test sees. Let's assume that's correct. Do you see that as an indicator that maybe some of those leagues, most of those leagues and teams were major, even if not declared that by the major leagues? This, this is a great question, and I think that a, there needs to be a lot of research into this, and B, there's going to be a lot of research into this. Like, it it was not seven leagues. There's there's more. So what are those leagues? You know, these three seasons that I listed for Josh Gibson. You know, I had a question the other day. You know, why isn't Josh Gibson on the all time? Um, you know, OPS, batting average, leaderboards, and whatnot. It's because he doesn't have three thousand plate appearances, and that that's our traditional. Uh, you know, uh, baseline. If you added those three seasons, he would reach 3000. And, you know, so then I looked at those seasons, who was on his team, who was he playing against? And it's all the same as, as you would see in the Negro major leagues. It's, it's all stars. It's, it's hall of famers. There's the reason that those are not major league teams right now is they did not play in a league as we think of it and if there's one thing about we know about the negro leagues is it was different than the american league and national league so now there's a lot of questions um that i, I want to find answers to like well what do we consider a league here is is the negro leagues can, can that be considered the league and then you know there were teams within that so there's a lot of a lot of things are going to happen here i think and uh yeah, I, I think that the seven major Negro Leagues is the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Ted and, and Adam. I, I was going to ask uh, just real quick before we end up, do I have it correct, Adam, that the two of the Sabre bios you've done are Dobie Moore and Home Run Johnson? Is that right? Uh, Heavy Johnson. Heavy Johnson. Uh, uh, and how, why, should, why did you choose them to do the bio? That, um, gosh, I don't know if you were doing this on purpose, but this is kind of a, a good little uh, preview into a talk I'll be doing at Sabre on the 25th Infantry Wreckers. And that that is a team that I've become very fascinated by as well. Um, 
I love Bullet Rogan. I think he's, you know, maybe one of the top or top four most valuable players in the history of the Negro Leagues. I think he's vastly underrated. And the more I started researching Bullet Rogan, the more I learned about uh, his teammates, not just in the Negro Leagues, but before he was in the Negro Leagues. And uh, on this army team in Hawaii in the 19 teens, Bullet Rogan was the pitcher. Oscar Heavy Johnson was the catcher. Doby Moore was the shortstop. And this was like a major league level team plying its trade in Hawaii against, you know, anyone that would play them. And I've just been so fascinated by that team. Uh, I've, you know, now all of the box scores from the Hawaiian Star Bulletin are on newspapers.com. So I've tabulated uh, stats from, you know, 160 games for, for you know, that team in in Hawaii and gotten to, to know not just about you know, Bullet Rogan, Johnson, and more, but all the other players that they played with. And, you know, I find even like there's a player, Allie Crafton, who was just as good as Doby Moore, who went on to be a star in the major leagues. But Allie, something happened to him. He got hurt or, or something else, and he never made it. And it just reminds me that there's so many amazing stars and stories that, you know, not just uh, you know, it's not that they just couldn't play in the AL and NL, but even outside of the Negro Leagues. Like there's there's so many uh, stories of amazing players all over the place and I just keep kind of keep coming up on these players. So I that's where Johnson and Moore, the interest in them came from. Like they followed uh, Bullet Rogan to the Negro Leagues. They were stars, but they all started on this one team together in Hawaii. And it was just fascinating that a team at that level could be, uh, you know, playing together in, in Hawaii. And, you know, Heavy Johnson played there for eight years, like his entire prime. And then he came to the Negro Leagues and, you know, won the batting title the first year and won the Triple Crown the next. And it's like, wow. <laughs> well, thank you, Adam. Thanks a lot. Uh, we'll give Sean uh, Gibson the last word. I know you've been uh, online with us, Sean. Turn it over to you. We appreciate Adam what you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, great presentation, man. I really appreciate you joining us today. Thank for everybody for joining us. Everybody that came in, great questions, great Q&A. Ted and Tom, great job. Uh, as we wrap up, our next session will be in August. And actually, I will be involved in that. So we have a new organization called the Nigglies Family Alliance. And we'll have different family members. Uh, right now, there'll probably be Gibson, Foster, Stearns, and Buck Leonard for the presentation next month. Uh, talking to you about our own families' uh, accomplishments through the, our individual Negro League players, as well as the importance of the Negro League Family Alliance. So tune in for that uh, for August, not next month, for August. Um, other than that, I want to thank everybody for joining us and uh, see you in August. Uh, Adam, stay on while we, while we close out, Adam. Will do. But thank thank you, you so much. And, um, we'll see you in August. I'm going to turn off the recording. Thank you, Ted, for reminding me.